This is a 1995 Ferrari F355 Spider, and it's beautiful. Probably the single most beautiful Ferrari made during my lifetime. It's also thrilling to drive, it sounds amazing, and it's a wee bit unreliable. <laughs> this F355 belongs to my friend Kenan, and today I'm going to review it and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, big news, this F355 Spider is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids with no reserve. Yes, that's right, Kenan is selling his beloved Ferrari red over tan with a gated manual transmission, absolutely gorgeous, and selling it with no reserve. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to visit the live auction for this Ferrari where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the 355 Spider. But before I dive into the weird, interesting stuff, a little overview of exactly what this car is. So the 355 was Ferrari's entry level model from 1995 through 1999. It was the mid engine V8 car. That was the entry Ferrari at the time in the days before the California, the Portofino and the Roma. These days, the mid engine sports car Ferrari is kind of the middle of the lineup, the F8 and the 296 GTB, but back in the 90s, it was the entry model. Now, after the 355 came the Ferrari 360, which debuted in 1999, and before the 355 came the 348, which had been sold from 89 to 94. Now, interestingly, even though the 355, it seems, it feels like a totally different car from the 348, it's not as different as you might think. This was really just an evolution of the 348, not a full redesign. And in fact, 348 and 355 body panels are interchangeable. So if you wanted to make your 348 look like a 355, you could pull off all the body panels and stick on 355 ones and, well, then it would. But there were some major, major changes to the 355 over the 348 that made it a much improved car. The biggest was the powertrain. The 348 used a 3.4 liter V8, hence the name, it only made about 300 horsepower. This car used a 3.5 liter V8, and one of the big differences was five valves per cylinder, hence 355 kind of changed up the naming convention, but they really wanted to draw attention to those five valves per cylinder. Now, the result was around 375 horsepower in the 355, a big improvement over the 300 in the 348, although worth pointing out, still not not all that much torque, around 270 pound feet in this car. Not a huge figure, but that's the way that Ferrari V8s work. They basically always have. Now, there were other major changes to the 355 over the 348. The body was one of them. It was a totally different looking car, even though, like I said, the panels are interchangeable. The 355 looked more modern, frankly, just more beautiful with its design, more conforming to the norms of the mid 90s. There were also more changes under the skin, improved suspension, helped the 355 steer, handle, and corner better. The interior was greatly different in the 355 compared to the older 80s looking interior of the 348. The manual transmission was greatly improved. Ferrari made a lot of changes under the skin to make it easier to shift gears in the 355. And the steering changed. Although this change may not have been for the better, the 355 introduced power steering where all the 348s had manual steering. Now, supposedly manual steering was an available option in the 355, but I've never seen a car equipped with it. I'm not sure if that's just a legend, but regardless, most of these have power steering. Most of the 348s are manual steering. We'll talk more about that when I get behind the wheel later in this video. So let's talk quirks and features, starting with getting in where you walk up to the car and you'll notice there's no visible door handle. So how do you open the door? The answer is it's hidden down 
down here in the air intake. You look down there and there's a handle and you can reach down, pull it and open up the door. I always found it funny that Ferrari went to the trouble of hiding the door handle, which is an ugly feature on the outside of cars. So that was nice, but they didn't bother to hide the keyhole, which is also ugly and it's sticking up right there, staring you in the face on the outside of this car. They should have hidden both. Anyway, it doesn't really matter where the door handle is because Kenan tells me any owner of a 355 Spider, the convertible model, they don't bother with the exterior door handle. They just reach in and grab the interior door handle and open up the door that way. It's easier. It saves you from having to bend down and look like an idiot reaching down here. And it's a cool way of saying, I am very experienced in the 355 Spider. I don't bother with the regular door handle. One other thing I really like about the door, at the back end of the door, you have this little black triangle that sticks up. I'm not sure if that's to guide the window or seal with the roof in some way, but functionally, the benefit is you can put your hand on that when opening or closing the door, so you don't have to put your hand on the freshly cleaned paint and make a handprint. It's a nice little touch in this car. But anyway, next we climb inside the 355 Spider, and the first thing you notice about this interior, when you look inside, it is very low, very flat, and very wide. That's exactly what you think getting in here. Low, flat, and wide. It looks and feels like an old school exotic car in here, probably because it is the 348's design being rooted in the 80s. This doesn't seem very modern. You're very low to the ground. There's not all sorts of style and screens flowing around you and crash protection. Well, it's not as significant. Every Everything seems like smaller and more vintage in this interior. That's your first impression when you get inside. But there's a lot of cool and interesting stuff to talk about it here, starting with the best part, the manual transmission, gated six-speed manual, as you can see, with the metal shaft, the silver ball on top, the old-school gated manual Ferrari. Nothing really beats that. Although Ferrari tried, it was the 355 where Ferrari Ferrari introduced its F1 paddle shift sequential manual automatic transmission, the first Ferrari built in any real numbers that had anything other than a manual transmission. It started here, and it turned out to be a major change for Ferrari. The introduction of the F1 transmission happened in 98, and by 2008, 2009, all Ferraris were automatics. The death of the manual began with this car. Now, a couple interesting things about that. Like I said, it came out for the 98 model year, and the 355 came out in 95. So there were three model years that were manual only. And after that, in 98 and 99, the F1 was an option. So there were still a lot of manual cars made. In fact, overall, only about a quarter of the 355s have the F1 automatic transmission. The vast majority still have the six-speed manual like this car. One other interesting F1 quirk about the 355, when when they came out with it, the models that had the F1 were not called F355, they were called 355F1. I guess Ferrari thought F355F1 sounded weird. There were too many Fs. So those cars were just 355F1, and this was the F355. A little subtle but weird Ferrari quirk. But anyway, next up onto the rest of the quirks in here, starting with the parking brake, which is mounted between the driver's seat and the door, which doesn't seem very convenient, but the operation makes it pretty useful. You can pull it up. Now the parking brake is engaged, but instead of it just sitting there blocking your entry and exit, you can now push it down so that it's out of the way. And so even though the parking brake is on right now, it's down, which seems a little counterintuitive, but it works if you're going to put the parking brake there. You also also have this leather pouch, which is actually removable, although perfectly sized for this space. And in this pouch, Kenan keeps a little fire extinguisher, which is probably a good idea if you have an older Italian car. <laughs> now, also in this area, you can see the latches for the front and rear compartments. We will get back to those in a second. First, let's talk about the rest of this interior, starting with the little switches next.
next to the gear lever. Over on the right, you have some odd ones. You have a lock switch, as you can see. Interestingly, this only locks the doors. The switch next to it with a little door and like a little lock that's raised, that unlocks the doors. So two separate switches for lock and unlock, which is obviously odd. You also have your heated mirror control here, nice luxury, and your sport suspension control here. You would put that on and the car would apparently get sportier. Next up, also interesting, in this center console full of controls, you have your climate controls in here. And I always loved the stop button in the corner. That turns off your air conditioning or heat. You don't just move it to zero, which you would think you would do. Instead, you press stop and then it stops, which I guess is sort of intuitive. But here's the weird part. When you want to start it again, what do you press? Not go, but stop. <laughs> when the climate control is off and you want it to turn on, you press stop because this was Ferrari and they made strange decisions, especially back then. Now, also in this area, you have these two flags, as you can see, the Ferrari flag and the Pininfarina flag, of course, the designer of this car. Now, Pininfarina and Ferrari later split up about 10 years after this car, which is a shame because Pininfarina created some of the most beautiful Ferrari models of all time, including this one. But that relationship was still going when this car was on sale, commemorated with these little flags on the ashtray cover. Now, also in this vicinity, a couple more switches back here. You have your seat controls, interestingly, driver and passenger. These switches move the seats forward or backwards. Not the typical placement where you might expect them, but that's where they are. More importantly, though, in the center here, this switch controls the convertible top. Like I said, this is a Spider model, which is Ferrari speak for convertible. And this car was offered in three different body styles. You could get the coupe, which was called the Berlinetta. You could get the convertible, which of course was called the Spider. Or you could get an interesting combination of the two, a coupe with a removable Targa roof panel that was called the GTS. Now, this used to be a common Ferrari body style throughout the 70s and 80s, but the 355 was the last mid-engine V8 Ferrari that offered it, beginning with the 360. You had to choose between coupe or convertible. There was no liftoff Targa option anymore. As for production numbers, Ferrari made around 11,300 of these F355s. Of those, roughly 4,900 were coupes. So that's the most common body style. Another 3,700 of these were spiders. So this is the second most common body style. And then the remaining 2,500 355s were GTS. So that is the rarest. But anyway, taking the top up or down. To do this, first you've got to remove this leather tonneau cover, which is snapped into place. You've got to do this manually, and it's kind of annoying. So most people with these cars just keep the top down and the tonneau cover on. You can drive around with the cover off, but it doesn't look as good just having the roof exposed, as you can see. So keeping the tonneau in place makes sense. Most people aren't driving these in the rain anyway. But once you've removed that cover, then you push the switch to raise the top, and the top raises, as you can see. It goes up in actually kind of a weird process. First straight up, and then it starts coming forward over the windshield, and it's a little bit unusual, but that brings your 355 Spider from an open top to a closed convertible roof. And of course, if you want to put the roof down, just go in the other direction. Same deal, flip the switch, and then the top starts to do its thing, going back and then down and then into the car, so you can go back to enjoying your 355 Spider in the sun with the wind in your hair. Of course, once it's in that position, you can refasten the tonneau cover so that it's back in place looking its best. But anyway, on to the last interesting quirks and features of this interior, the gauge cluster. You can see the gauges are very serious. No fun or interesting or strange quirks here. Very serious. And they continue into the center control stack where you have three more gauges. Strangely enough, including the fuel gauge. That's not in the driver's gauge cluster. It's here in the center. That's where you see your fuel. Also interesting in this car, the horn operated with these little buttons on the side of the steering wheel. You press it and it sounds ridiculous. Take a listen. <laughs> 
And then, of course, you have the pop-up headlights. You twist the end of the turn signal stalk, and the headlights pop up. They come up, they look cool, and this was a very late car to have pop-up headlights. In fact, the 355 was the last new Ferrari that was released with pop-up headlights, although they continued on in the 456 a little longer through 2002. But the late 90s was kind of the end of pop-up headlights, and this car was the end of the line for Ferrari. Also interesting, worth pointing out in here, the interior door handle is kind of cool. I briefly mentioned it earlier, but it's mounted here on the grab handle you use to close the door. The upper part of that is the door handle, kind of a cool hidden integration. You lift on that and the door opens. And speaking of interesting handles, back to the ones for the compartments front and rear. Let's start with the front trunk compartment, which is open down here. You stick your hand where it comes out, pull on it, and then the front trunk pops open. Now, getting into the front trunk, a of interesting items here. For one thing, it is rear hinged, meaning it opens forward, which is kind of an interesting quirk. But more importantly, it's huge, surprisingly large. This is one of the largest frontal storage areas I've ever seen in any exotic car I've reviewed. You could get some real sized bags in here if you wanted to take your 355 on a trip. Now, of course, Kenan has various Ferrari memorabilia and accoutrement in here instead of any luggage. One of the cool things he has is this little-sized poster of the original event where the 355 Spider debuted. Ferrari first showed this car off on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills in the summer of 95. They closed down Rodeo Drive and they debuted the 355 Spider. And this is a smaller version of the poster from that day. More interestingly, though, is this large leather Ferrari briefcase that's located here in this front trunk. This is the toolkit, and it's shockingly comprehensive. You open it up, and there's levels and levels of tools that are included here. A pretty cool artifact for this car. Ferrari figured that at least 355 owners might be doing some basic maintenance, and so they gave them the tools for the job in this leather briefcase that came with the car. A neat touch. And next up, we move into the engine bay to see the glorious engine. But before we do that, getting back here is kind of cool. You pull the latch in the driver's door jam I showed you before, and then the engine cover automatically opens. Pull the latch, it pops right open, which is nice and convenient. But with it open, you can see the powertrain, the 3.5 liter V8 with those five valves per cylinder, 375 horsepower, like I mentioned before, the big boy. <laughs> 355's engine. Actually, I joke, it's a small V8, but performance was good. Zero to 60 in the high four second range, which was excellent for a car like this in its day, and frankly, still pretty quick today. And it sounded fantastic. Take a listen to a couple of 355 revs. <laughs> Ah, the 355 engine. Glorious to listen to, glorious to feel, not so glorious to own. This car had some serious drawbacks. I alluded to earlier some reliability issues, and there were a few obvious ones. The headers is a big one. They can crack, they can fail, and that's an expensive replacement. The valve guides is another one. They were made of a material, bronze, that wasn't up to the task of valve guiding, and they would also fail over time, which can cause significant and serious damage. Those are the big issues of 355, expensive things you have to account for. Thankfully, this car has them done, as Kenan will mention later in his video. The other big 355 issue, though, is just maintenance, not even repairs. This engine has to come out in order to do routine belt service maintenance. Ferrari says you got to do it every three years. Take the engine out of the car, although functionally, most people do it every five or maybe six years. But still, it ain't easy and it ain't cheap. It 
costs around eight to $12,000, depending on how many other while you're in there as you take care of every five years to deal with this powertrain. And that made this car a little temperamental, shall we say. But the performance was great, the sound was great, and the styling is great. I mentioned earlier, I think this car is beautiful, but that is an understatement. I find the 355 to be one of the most gorgeous modern sports cars, modern Ferraris, truly up there in the top five or six most beautiful. It's fantastic to look at. I actually prefer the coupe because it has this roof line that slopes down and back and gives it a very special feel with that rear pillar. Although Kenan reminds me that if you get the convertible like this, you can hear the engine better, which is reasonable. And the Spider looks great too. Although you can get the best of both worlds if you get a GTS, which has that coupe rear pillar line, but also the removable roof of the convertible. Drawback is the GTS is the least common, as I mentioned before, and thus it has become the the most valuable by far. In fact, a nice GTS with a manual transmission is now selling for maybe double what a Spider is, which seems a little high to me since this car has almost all of the charm and the look, but that's what the market thinks. Highly values the GTS since you get it all. All right, driving the 355 Spider, the controversial Ferrari F355. So let's talk it over. This car is so sweet to drive. And I hate to say that because I know that it's problematic to own. I know that it's unreliable. I know that even if it is reliable, maintenance is expensive. This car is just a difficult vehicle to own, but it's beautiful, it sounds great, and I love to drive it. Okay, for one thing, I mentioned earlier this car has like an old school feeling interior with how low it is. That translates to it just feels low and open and old school when you're driving it. You know, a lot of people talk about how they have an analog car because they're in a 997-911. Give me a break. That car has screens and it's nothing. This is an analog car. This has all the sounds, the noises. It really is of old school. It's 1995 might not seem vintage, but this car feels vintage to drive. And that applies to basically every aspect of it. It just feels so charmingly old school in such a cool way. I mean, the shifter getting into these gates is so satisfying and it does shift a lot better than the 348, which is one of the benefits. But also it's just so mechanical. You do have some creaks and rattles, but you just kind of feel like that was part of it. The, the old school Italians have put this together. I mean, it's not a Porsche. That's one of its great charms. But one really cool thing about it is, even though it is an old school Ferrari, it's not slow. 375 horsepower is a pretty good number. It's not the fastest Ferrari around. There's no question about that. But it's not like it's a slow car. And so you have this vintage feel without having to compromise on performance like you kind of have to in a 308 and a 328. It's fast enough that it still feels exotic and supercar like There's something to this that makes it feel like it was hand built, you know, and there were, and there were differences, variations between them. Oh, the sound of it is so glorious. And then the clink of the upshift. Oh. Now, I wanna be clear. There is one drawback to the 348 driving experience, although in my mind, only one. And that is the steering. Ferrari went from manual steering in the 348 to power steering in the 355 like I mentioned before, and the result was not good. The handling in this car is great. It corners amazingly. You can jam on the throttle coming out of corners. It's great, but the steering feel is not particularly good. It is over-assisted. It feels a little weird. Sometimes you point the car and don't really expect the body to kind of go like that. It's hard to really explain, but it's, it's certainly not as quick and precise and intuitive and mechanical as either old school or brand new modern feeling cars. Uh, it, it just is an early attempt at power steering and not a great one. It could have been better. And that's really the Achilles heel from a driving perspective of 355. But honestly, I can put up with it. If that's the only drawback to this otherwise glorious, vintage, old school feeling, wonderful sounding driving experience, I'll take that all day long. It's not like a modern supercar. Like it doesn't rev as fast. It doesn't accelerate as fast. 
but that's not what you're looking for. In my mind, when you drive this car, you want this, this soul. And very few cars feel to me like they have an emotional soul, like driving the 355, especially because you sit in here and you know that it's not perfect, that it has its issues, and that's part of the soul. And I mean, that's what annoying people say about temperamental cars. Well, it has character, but it does. It's just great to drive and to use and to feel the emotion to this car. I, I, I don't understand how a person can't have a connection to this car. And I gotta tell you, I drive a lot of cars, and the 355 is one of the ones that I bond with emotionally and fall in love with the quickest of any cars that I ever, ever drive. It's just, it's so pure in its, in its imperfection and yet perfection. I'm getting poetic here. I'll leave it at this. This is a great car to drive. Not the fastest, but if you just want a beautiful driving experience, this is that. Just be prepared to pay to own this car and to feel like this. And I'll say also this, I owned a 360. A 360 doesn't feel like this. This car is special. And so that's the Ferrari F355 Spider, Kenan's F355. This car is wonderful, a joy to drive, tremendously thrilling and gorgeous. One of the most beautiful modern sports cars. These cars have a reputation for being, well, difficult. But to me, that's part of the whole experience. You have to make some sacrifices in order to be able to see and hear and enjoy Enjoy the F355, and you can buy this one on cars and bids. Anyway, now it's time to give the 355 a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 54 out of 100, which places the F355 Spider here against other similar cars, just two points behind the F355 Coupe I reviewed a few years ago. And the two points behind solely because the Coupe is that much more beautiful. Otherwise, the scores are the same, and they reflect a truth about the F355. It's amazingly cool, it's fun to drive, it's fast, it's buzzy, it's exciting, it's gorgeous, and it's scary to own and expensive to operate. If the F355 were easy to own, own, it would be one of the greatest exotic cars ever made, but you can't have everything.